Hello, everybody. Hopefully, we have everybody here. Welcome to the welcome to the live stream. I'm going to just uh, kill this here so we don't get any echo there, and I'm just going to pop in here. So, hello, everybody. I hope that my audio is good. Let me know in the chat in the comments if you can hear me, or if if not, then I guess I'll just continue on and assume that you can. So um, welcome, everybody. Today we're going to talk about cloud computing. So it's a topic that comes up quite a lot in my classroom. It comes up quite a lot in conversations that I have. You know, cloud computing is sort of the third wave of computation, and it's really something quite important here. So just going to pop in here. And make sure we're good. Uh, just as a quick note as well, I think some folks were giving me some feedback that if you're joining us today from LinkedIn, you might not be able to post comments. And I did want to make this a live session specifically so that if you have any questions, I can try to answer them as best I can here, here live. If you're watching this after the fact, feel free to put comments on the video and I'll try my best to respond to comments and answer them there as well. Thanks, Helmut. I appreciate it very much. So we're going to talk about cloud computing, and I really want to talk about a few aspects of it. I want to talk about where does it fit into the whole concept of computing in general, and why is it really important for us to understand it? Why is it important for us to understand what it is? And then I want to specifically look at three aspects of cloud computing, where we look at something called software as a service, which will be very familiar to you. You're probably using software as a service and might not be aware that it's a cloud-based solution. And then we're going to talk about infrastructure as a service, which is an easier concept to understand if you've worked with any type of computer infrastructure. And then I think the one that's a little bit tricky for folks is something called platform as a service. And I'm going to talk about that as well. And then um, I'll talk about maybe some future steps and we'll see, we'll see how things go. So please feel free to post in the comments here, in the, in the chat here, any questions you may have. I'll try to glance over. As you know, I'm a, I'm a solo guy here, so I'm on my own looking at all the screens here, making sure that we're running okay. And I'll start with some coffee. Okay, everyone. So, uh, you know, what is cloud computing? And first of all, thank you so much for joining me this evening if you're here or, or watching after the fact. You know, I have a screen down below. I'm just going to share off my whiteboard here. And uh, so if I'm looking down a little bit, uh, it's because I'm, I'm looking at the whiteboard on my computer here. So, you, you know, many, many years ago, we used to have a mainframe computer. And the idea behind a mainframe computer is we took a lot of the different resources of a computer and we put them all into one place. And that place was referred to as the mainframe. So, for example, I would have the, the processor itself. I'm just going to go and change the whiteboard here. I'll make sure that's there. So what we would do is we'd have the processor here, and that would be the computation capability of the computer. So I would have some sort of processor that, or maybe in the case of mainframe, sometimes even multiple processors. And then I would also have my storage on that mainframe computer. So I would have some sort of storage devices for permanent storage. And then I would have the memory on that mainframe. And that memory would be able to control what's happening. And then, then what we would do with the mainframe is we would have a number of terminals. And these terminals would be, in this case, very low powered. So the terminals that I had connected to a mainframe, in fact, the only thing that the terminals were very good for was sending keyboard and video movement into the mainframe. So I would use these to send keyboard, uh, you know, text to the mainframe. I would receive text back from the mainframe. And on my screen, I would have text back and forth. And the network for that mainframe was a localized network. Usually, if if you if you're old, if you're if you got white hair and you're or gray hair like myself, you would remember the days where we would have basically a room full of different terminals. The mainframe would be in a room separate to us, right across the usually right across the hall or so. And then what we would do is we would we would all sit at our terminals and we would sit there and do a whole bunch of programming. 
And in fact, I still have a lot of nostalgia for those days. A lot of times what I will do is, um, is I'll still set my DOS command prompt or my command prompt to be green on black so that I can be nostalgic for the old computing days. You might be wondering, why am I going into the mainframe world here? Well, this was really the first wave of computing. So this is considered the first wave of computing with centralized resources and access to those resources, usually in the same building, usually close to that resource because we didn't have a global network at that point. Uh, later on with academic institutions and such, we started getting global network, the earliest uh, sort of inklings of the internet. But for now, this is considered our first wave. What happened was those resources became quite expensive. So we had these expensive resources that were the mainframe computers were not cheap. And uh, so some folks got the idea when the personal computer came out that I would take my personal computers and what I would do is I could share resources in multiple personal computers. One of the, the classic examples of something that we would share is if I got a fancy laser printer. So what I would do is I would get my computers connected to a network of some sort, and then I would be connected to a shared printer. And then that way, you know, back then a laser printer, say it was five or six thousand dollars, I could spend say the five thousand dollars on the printer and I could have everybody in my accounting office connect up and share the single printer. This evolved quite a bit and this became client server where I would have dedicated machines that would store files, that would be the storage component, and then I would have all my files on a file server. And there's a lot, you know, I'm, I'm short forming some of the infrastructure here, teach a whole eight month program just on infrastructure uh, back in, you know, the past 15 or so years, you know, 1998 to 2014, 15. And then what we would do is we'd have our computers, which would have computation and storage of their own, but we would try to centralize a lot of our files and such on a file server and have shared resources again, like printers. One of the earliest networks that came out was one called uh, Novell Networks that allowed me to connect up personal computers. That is a very rough analogy of the second wave of computation, but that would be the client server wave of computation. So we have client servers. The reason the cloud is important for us to learn is because it represents the third wave of computation. And in fact, it kind of evolved into this third wave from the second wave in the same way that mainframes were so expensive that they gave birth to the personal computer so that instead of having to submit jobs to a mainframe or the compu computing department, I could run some of my software, most notably spreadsheets like VisiCalc, Lotus123, Nowadays, we love it as Excel. Um, those types of things could be run on these personal computers. And every all my heavy computing was done on the mainframe. And I do remember because sort of the end of my personal experience uh, in, in being trained on computers, when I went to college, I actually studied on both mainframes and on personal computers. The mainframe is where I did computer science. And the personal computer is where I would have done um, I would have done quantitative quantitative methods, things like Excel and, and those types of things. Thanks, Terry. Appreciate it. And uh, so then, you know, I was here at the beginning at the mainframe. That was the end of my academic sort of initial academic career. And then I was very much involved in client server. And actually, a huge part of what I, I did was train people on Microsoft, Novell Technologies, Microsoft Technologies, Apple Technologies, um, and, and those types of client servers. And I still remember, you know, I used to get a lot of pushback. A lot of people say, well, if you're going to do any serious computing, you have to have mainframes or mini computers, which are just really mainframes by another name. It was still a mini computer. It was less expensive than a big big metal IBM type of, it, of, of system. And then I'd have these client server. And then there was a lot of, you know, argument, you know, Novell uh, is, as a client server, Microsoft as a client server system, whatever it may be. Well, what ended up happening in the 
clients server you know these early thousands and i feel like i'm teaching a computer history lesson here but this context is important to understand cloud computing is that we started saying you know what through the through the concept session on virtualization as well but through the concepts of virtualization what i could do is build a large data center and then I could allocate resources in a virtual way in order to provide a private data center. And then that private data center could be accessed by clients, and those clients would be able to, to avail themselves of concentrated computational storage and memory resources, so centralized resources. So this becomes the data center or the on-prem data center became a way of saving money because you're consolidating resources and you're allocating on an as-needed basis. And it also became a way of managing those resources because you could manage everything in sort of this centralized data center. And then you could allocate it out to your clients as needed. And then those clients could be uh, to whatever level of computational storage and memory capacity that you needed. So this would be the on-prem data center. This then became available through the internet. So what we would do is we would take remote users or we would take branch offices or whatever the case be, we would take these resources and we would make them available through the internet. And this received the name of the cloud. Now, in the case where I'm taking my private data center and I'm putting that out on the cloud, we refer to that as a as a um, private cloud. Oh, thanks, Maddie. And uh, and then this now also becomes the, this third wave of computation because now what we're looking at is we're looking at large companies such as Amazon, Microsoft, Google. IBM, as well as smaller companies with a specialized data center, such as Dropbox with an optimized storage data center, or uh, things like, uh, well, Microsoft OneDrive is part of the Azure environment, but there are a lot of companies that built their own data centers, and then they made them available or portions of them available on the internet, and that became the third wave of computation or the cloud. And probably... One of the best examples of, of the cloud is you take a company like Amazon. Amazon, which their web services are Amazon Web Services, which is a clever name for their web services. They began as a e-commerce platform, as we know. We know, we, we know Amazon today. And with the Amazon Web Services, basically Amazon was building their e-commerce solution for capacity so that they could grow and they could constantly deliver websites, the Amazon website, and they could manage inventory and the databases that supported the inventory and all of those things. They were building for a whole lot of capacity. And what wound up happening is they wound up having ac excess capacity. And somebody at Amazon got the bright idea, the multi-billion dollar bright idea, that if we have extra capacity, why not create a front end and let businesses that are low or have a capacity deficit use some of our access capacity or excess capacity in order to do things like store their backups or store their files? And, and so they made the first thing they made available was in cloud data storage. One of the problems that I had in the second wave of computing is that I needed to back up all my files in case I had some sort of catastrophic event and lost all my hard drives or I lost power or I got flooded or whatever the case may be. So if I build it myself, you can't just build one file server. You have to build one file server plus a backup file server. Plus, you might have to co-locate both those file servers. So now you're up to four file servers. Then you want to make sure you're backing it up, and then you want to make sure you have the ability to restore it. Well, imagine if instead you could go through the internet, and what you could do is you could store everything on Amazon's managed storage. You have a whole bunch of people that are doing nothing but managing the storage. 
And it was way cheaper than you having to go out and build co-locate centers. And it was way cheaper than you having to go out and build additional file servers and run manual backups. You could just back up into those storage facilities. And that became the basis of what today we know as a cloud service because I'm going to clear the canvas here. Because what happened is those initial things that we did where basically it was just disk in the cloud or disk across the internet and other companies out there, a good example would be something like a, a Dropbox. You know, these are companies, uh, they, they just store your data. Other companies jumped on the bandwagon. So another good example, you may be familiar, familiar with Dropbox for storing files. You might be familiar, familiar with Google Drive. You might be familiar with OneDrive, which used to be called SkyDrive, but then they, they had to rename it because there was a battle with another company called SkyDrive. And um, you might be familiar with iCloud if you're an Apple user. Oh, and that was mostly for backing up your, your photos and your music. So if you had photos and music, you didn't have to go and buy an external hard drive. Your external hard drive was Apple's data center. And the beautiful thing about that, of course, is that, you know, if you look at a data center by, by any of these cloud providers, they are massive data centers. And they have a dedicated staff making sure that nothing is going to uh, go wrong. If a hard drive fails, they replace the hard drive. If, uh, if an entire higher geographic location fails, they may have geo, uh, geographically diverse, uh, uh, separated data centers. These are multi-billion dollar infrastructures that you can buy for $5 a month for just simple data storage. Obviously, you're not using the entire data center, but you're using that tiny little fraction, and that, that's where the cloud comes in. Now, there is some pushback on this because now you are, in fact, storing your files on somebody else's data center. So you better trust them to, to be, you know, legitimate with your data and not give it to someone else, not to do any data mining on it, not to do, you know, anything. And I do have another video here on the channel where I talk about encrypting your data, both at rest and encrypting your data in transit so that you can actually encrypt your data. So even though the, the bits are sitting on a external storage that is in fact being managed by someone else, it, it's impossible to be read by someone else because the encryption algorithm is robust enough that it would basically take extraordinarily powerful um, systems to de-encrypt it. Now you have another discussion about a recent announcement by IBM around their quantum computing system, but, uh, but that day isn't here yet. So the idea here is that you should be able to control that. And this is just for storage. Well, what happened was it, because we were able to use tools such as virtualization, what we could do is instead of just providing you with storage on the cloud, these data centers started saying, let's add some more services. And one of the most natural services that came out there were web services. So instead of you having to have a web server and your web server has all of your web pages on it and everybody has to come through the internet to your web server, retrieve those pages and put it onto their browser, what you could do is you could store those on a dedicated web server provided by a host, a web host. Well, a web host is in fact a cloud provider. They're actually putting your files along with everybody, all the other customers' files on here. And then what happens is you're using the DNS system. And uh, stay tuned because I'm going to do some more live streams on networking where I'll talk about uh, uh, different layers of the OSI model. I did one earlier and I'm going to talk about uh, how DNS works. But effectively, they find your web page through a through the domain naming system so they'll put in a name like franksclass.ca so that's actually a, a website that's my blog so if you go to franksclass.ca it goes and it finds a particular set of files which is my blog files so web hosting became another very useful tool that was provided by these web uh, by these cloud providers 
And then, of course, it stood to reason that if we have storage and we have web, why not provide some e-com solutions? So why not provide some sort of shopping basket functionality? Why not provide some sort of way to store data and to retrieve and input data to and from a web application or even a custom application that we might have out there? And this just continued to grow. The more and more and more services started being added to the various different cloud services that we have. So we were able to go in and we were able to say, I want to have storage. I want to have a web server. I would like to have a database. I would like to have an Internet of Things IoT ingestion hub. I would like to have a data warehouse. I would like to have all these things into the cloud. And more and more of these things are being added in. We can even have a private branch exchange PBX, a private branch exchange telephone system in the cloud. So you can do things like Skype would be an example of that. You could do things like Zoom call meetings, things like team meetings, things like team phone numbers. All of these things can be provisioned in the data center by these vendors, and you just have to connect up to it, and you use that portion of their data center that is appropriate to your needs. So I hope everybody's following along well so far and understanding sort of this, this evolution of the cloud. Let me show you a couple of things here that you might find interesting. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to take a look. Here's an example of a cloud service provider. This happens to be Microsoft Azure. So I've logged into my Microsoft Azure account and you can see here don't worry too much about the dashboard at this point. If you are interested, again, you can comment uh, either now or you can comment afterwards and let me know if there's any specific areas that you'd like to see some videos on. But what I want to demonstrate here is look at this. If I go into create a resource, look at all of the different infrastructure and different, well, I'll talk about different types of resources, but look at all of the different resources that I can create on their data center and then I can connect to and use from my system here at home. So let's say, for example, I was teaching a class and I wanted to teach students how to work with Unix, a very common operating system. Uh, it's maybe not as common for people to use Unix and Linux as a desktop operating system, at least in comparison with something like Windows. But if you look at something like Max OS X, it in fact is a Unix operating system. And if I'm building some electronic circuitry, or if I'm building a, a lot of, well, bottom line is a lot of things use Unix. And Linux is, is a clone of, of Unix. But I don't want my students to have to erase their Windows machine. I don't want them to have to potentially cause hard drive problems on their Mac. I don't want them to be running Unix and Linux commands that can cause problems on the machine that they're using to run their productivity application. So what can I do? Well, what I could do is I could have them create a virtual machine. That's not that hard to do. And I do have videos here on the channel where I talk about creating virtual machines. And, and again, if there's an interest, I'll do a live stream just on virtual machines. But what I could do here, so I could choose a virtual machine. There's also a whole bunch of pre-built virtual machines. So I could actually have them run an Ubuntu server. And they could spin an Ubuntu server up on Microsoft's Azure infrastructure and then connect up and practice their skills. They could run a Windows 11 Pro system up on the cloud and then access it from their Mac machine, as an example. So if they're using an Apple machine, they maybe have to run a Windows 11 Pro machine for two hours to do a lab. They could actually run it in the infrastructure of the cloud and then they would be able to use that machine and then when they were done with it they could just delete it all and they would no longer be charged there are charges for this but it would be cheaper for them to go up and run a machine a windows 11 machine for two hours a week than it would be for them to go out and buy a brand new laptop theoretically i have another video on the channel called don't buy a new computer or buy a new don't buy a new computer use an azure virtual vm it's a, it's actually a very popular video on the channel it's the one with the most views on my channel but 
Some people think I'm saying use it as your permanent machine. I'm not. I'm saying you could use it for doing labs and that sort of thing. You can create all these things. If we go down the side here, hopefully everybody can see where my mouse is here. You can see I can do things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, analytics. I can do, there's lots of things you can do here. Internet of things, media servers, mixed reality servers. Now, some people will say, well, what about if I want to run a gaming machine? I want to run, you know, something like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Fortnite or Overwatch or any of Valorant, any of these video games, Call of Duty. Um, normally, this is where it hasn't evolved enough in the cloud. The, the movement of graphics to and from a data center through the internet is a little bit slow. However, what a lot of people don't realize is if you're playing a game with online other people, you are actually running, um, you're running the cloud. Yeah, and if you can't, if your existing computer can't upgrade to Windows 11, you know, but you need Windows 11 for a little bit, right? Then that's, you know, that's a great way to have that machine running. Um, Helmet, are you using Windows 365 or are you using Windows Azure for the for the Windows 11? Because you, you do have to be a little bit careful on the um, on the costing of it. You, you know, if you're running it all the time, but if you're you know turning it off and turning it on. You'd actually be, if you watch the costing of it, you'd be surprised that you can still use it a fair amount and, and you don't have to go out and buy a new computer. So that's always a cool thing to do as well. Um, so if you take a look at all the different things we can do here, when it comes to video games, you're actually using the cloud, but you're not using the cloud for the graphics. A lot of times with a video game player, they're, they're installing the game graphics, right? So they have all the game graphics here on their on their computer, but they're going up to a data center and working with the data set of the game provider, Blizzard or whoever's or, or whoever's running it. And um, and they're sending a lot of data back and forth in terms of position that drives the local graphics. So they're actually using the cloud and um, yeah, 12 bucks a month. So there's a good example. One of the Things I get on the other video that I have is everybody says it's going to cost you too much. It's going to cost you too much. But, you know, there you go. $12 a month. That's a lot better, I think, than going out and buying even a four or $500 PC that, you know, do you then have to play around with it? So I'm really glad to hear that that's working out for you. That's really cool, actually. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to call you into a, to a meeting with anybody who tells me that it's too expensive to run a Azure machine. It's, it's a, it's a silly debate, but it, the proof, the proof is if you use it correctly, you can actually use it efi efficiently. So one of the things that I often do here is, is I sort of think, okay, this is great. There's so many different things here that I can do with Azure. And we tend to think of things sort of from a consumer level. Um, but they're really, and I'm going to show you another thing that we can do. Here's an example of a cloud service. I run for my students, all of their labs for Microsoft courses. I run them through this extreme lab service, which is using cloud services. It actually sits on top of Azure. And I actually can say to my students, oh, you need to do a lab on um, building a relational database in the cloud. And they're like, okay. That, you know, because we want to put data up in the cloud, I can have them use this instead of having to modify their existing computer. I can even have students that are running, maybe they're running um, something like a Mac computer. Um, I haven't had any students that are, you know, using a Raspberry Pi, but you could. Because theoretically, all you're exchanging between your computer and that data center is keyboard and video. And in the case of a graphic system, mouse movement. So keyboard, video, mouse. All the compute storage and everything else is running here. So there's there's a lot we can do that way. And when we take a look, and yeah, and we take a look at the uh, yeah, I've got I've gotten some pretty funny comments on that. I have the one video I'll tell you. It's don't buy a new computer. I think people read the title, and most people like it. There, there, it's, it's all good and everything. But uh, every so often, I'll get somebody on there who'll will be like. Um, you know, it's going to cost you $500 a month. And I'm like, whoa, I don't, I don't know what computer you're running to, to get to that amount of money, but uh, it's quite, quite interesting. So if I take a look at cloud services, you know, I talked to you guys about the idea that there's all the storage 
and I talked to you guys how there's, you know, things like services like a web server. And I showed you in the Azure portal that I could create virtual machines like a Linux machine and Ubuntu server. You can get some pretty heavy duty machines here as well. So for example, you know, if I'm a large corporation and I'm, I'm dealing with massive data sets, I could have a SQL server that's running on the Microsoft data center and it, and it might cost me, you know, somewhere around $10,000 a month. And you might say, whoa, that's a lot of money, $10,000 a month. Well, it's like most things, you know, a $10,000 engine in a car is not too much to pay if you're using that car to drive around every day. I, so maybe that's not the best example. It's, you know, it's, it's not too much to pay if the $10,000 engine is running a $200,000 machine, right? So the idea is that you can go there. It's, um, it's very useful. Yeah, you're in control of what you pay for. And that's the key helmet, right? That's, uh, you know, you're really, you're in control. You do have to spend a little bit of time so it doesn't run away on you. But once you spend time, you're in control of it. And a good example is with my students. I have many students who only need to use some advanced features of an operating system for two hours a week while they do the two-hour lab. So instead of buying a 24-7 machine, they can buy a two-hour machine. And, and when it comes to students, by the way, if anybody here is uh, or anybody later on is, is watching this, um, if you're an educator or a student, go to Azure for Education. You get a bunch of free credits as a student plus a number of services that are always free. And um, the same applies to Google. IBM and Amazon Web Services, all of the cloud providers are, are pretty generous with allowing people to use their services. So when it comes to the most common thing that we're familiar with, when it comes to the cloud, in fact, we're so familiar with it, we might not even know that we're using it, is something called software as a service. And I have this book here. I've got a link to it down in the description. So uh, this book's called Behind the Cloud. And you, you may have um, heard of a company called uh, Salesforce. And what Salesforce did is they built a cloud solution, which was a customer relationship management system, a CRM. So imagine that you have a whole bunch of salespeople across a city, across a province or a state, or, or whatever the, the geographical, uh, wherever you are in the world, it might be called something else, but you have people spread out geographically. And you could create one of two systems. You could create a system where everybody has an application on their phone to keep track of their customers, the customer orders and all of that. And then they have to come in through the internet or dial in to your business office, no matter in one location, get that information, exchange information. Well, if that goes down or if there's geographic distance, that could be problematic. So what happened is this company called Salesforce actually went in and said, what we're going to do is we'll have a web accessible uh, customer relationship management system. And you can come in and you can use it. So we'll create a tenant for you. We'll create one for your company. And all of your salespeople, all of your supply chain people, all of the people that need to work with customers will have one central location. And we'll hire security experts that will be monitoring this 24 hours a day. And we'll hire storage experts that will make sure that the storage is running 24 hours a day. And we'll hire IT and networking people and web people. So what they're doing is they're concentrating the expertise and the resources, and you are just paying a small fee in order to get a portion of all of that expertise and all of that. And this sales force is software as a service because the people using it don't know anything other than they have an application on their computer and their phone. This is how most of the applications on your iPhone or your Android phone run. Most of those applications are software as a service. They're actually web front ends to the cloud service, which is running the application on a centralized data service, uh, server. So the, the data center. So uh, common ones that you might be familiar with, if any of you have done anything with Google Docs, 
So Google Docs, Google Sheets, Hangouts, uh, Google Drive, all of the Google uh, pro productivity applications, those are entirely cloud-based. You don't download and install the Google Office Suite. You use the, the web to connect up to the Google Office Suite. And another example is Microsoft Office. Now, Microsoft Office lives in both worlds. You can download and install Microsoft Office, or you could just use the web apps for Microsoft Office through a web interface. That's a little known secret as well. If you ever see a video on the internet here on YouTube that says um, how to get Microsoft Office for free, Microsoft Office is free if you use the web apps. As long as you sign in with an account, you don't have to buy a license to Microsoft Office. It's only if you want to download it, and then you synchronize your downloaded version with the cloud version across multiple devices. So this is software as a service. We're often using this, uh, you know, this is just be, you're running an app, but instead of that app living on a local hard drive, that app lives up in a cloud-based environment. And this is super handy. A great example of this is iCloud. So if I was to take a picture with my iPhone right now, it would then load the picture onto my iPhone, but it would also synchronize that with iCloud. And then if I went into my other office and grabbed one of my Mac computers, opened it up, it would synchronize. That photo would appear in both locations. And in fact, you can install iCloud on your Windows machine. So you take one photo with the mobile device and it appears in multiple locations. That's really convenient for somebody who's like a user, like me taking photos or I take a note or write a document. But imagine if you were a sales company. Imagine if you were a sales force. And I went in and I made a contact with one of my customers at a grocery store. Maybe I'm a maybe I work for Coca-Cola and I realized that they're running out of certain soft soft drinks. And I could just make the note that they're out of soft drinks that immediately gets transferred to the loading dock where the trucks are. And by the time I'm walking out of that grocery store, a truck is driving to that grocery store to bring more soft drinks and make sure that those shelves are never empty, right? So that's a very important thing. Uh, uh, that's software as a service, and it's something very powerful. Another example of that is, um, I won't go, there are literally thousands of different examples here. But this also, um, so another example would be like an accounting package like Quicken has gone to the cloud or tax packages. Those are very common ones that you can have as uh, software as a service as well. But now imagine this. Imagine if you're a developer and you have a great idea for some software, but that software requires collaboration or social or some way to connect people together. Your limit on growth in the previous, in the, in the days of client server, was you could not onboard any new customers until you had enough storage, compute, and, and network, and memory in order to allow those customers to join. But now you have a data center, a multi-billion dollar data center, and maybe you're only buying $20 a month worth of that data center. But you get a 1,000 customers. You can crank that power up. Maybe now you're paying $50 a month. Then you get 10,000 customers. You're paying $500 a month. Then you have 100,000 customers. You're paying $5,000 a month. So you can scale it up as you go. This has really leveled the playing field in terms of software development because you are not, now not bound by hardware restrictions. You're only bound by getting as many people to use your software as you want and being able to somehow monetize it. This is really how the entire, everything from Instagram to Facebook to all of these companies came into being right? They, 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 they weren't constrained because they were able to use these data centers in order to scale up as, as it grew. So a company like, uh, say, an Instagram or so, they, they um, and I, I don't know 100%, I believe they started with Amazon Web Services, and they can just scale as big as they need to be um, as they get more customers, which is pretty neat when you think about it. Now, the other aspect so that's software as a service. And this means that I, as a developer, I, I just have to go in. I don't have to hire 
a client. I don't have to hire a server manager. I don't have to hire somebody to manage my network. Well, sorry, network's always going to be important because you have to get out to the internet and back from the internet. But I don't have to hire as many IT or infrastructure resources as I normally would have because I'm going to be able to just leverage all of the expertise and data center resources. And then, yeah, you pay more as you use more. But theoretically, if you're a software developer and people are using it, you're, you're, you're making more money. Now, when we get into things like building social networks and stuff, it's beyond the scope of this. But then you get things like, you know, first round venture capital and then follow up rounds of capital in order to fund growth. A lot of the funding of that would go towards both trying to acquire more people to use your service, as well as pay for the infrastructure to support the growth of it. And then you sell it for $13 billion. You know, I've done that several, eight, several, several times. I have, I have not done this. I have not become a internet billionaire yet. Okay, so anyway, so that's that. So the next thing I'm going to talk about when it comes to cloud is infrastructure as a service. So if I'm using the so if I'm using the cloud to build software packages, websites and different applications, then the next question is why should I build anything on premise? Why should I have my file server on premise? Why should I have my database server on premise? Why should I have to build an entire infrastructure in my basement when instead I could buy the same services in the cloud. Now, there's an argument to say you should do your own. There's an argument to say, but the point here is I don't have to. So what I can do is I could buy effectively hardware in the cloud, and then I could install my own licenses on that hardware. So I might want to be able to manage, say, my Windows server completely myself. So I might have a sysadmin and I might have a whole crew of people that are used to running, you know, the environment. I don't want to run it, you know, as a software solution. I want to be able to go in and, you know, install my own custom application. So let's say, for example, I'm in a very specialized in, uh, industry, right? Oh, perfect. Yeah. And if you have, yeah. So, so hopefully this helps you when you're prepping for the exam. If not, let me know. I'll make sure that I, uh, if it's not clear to you, I'll make sure it is. So infrastructure as a service, that might be something like, let's say I've developed an application. Let's say I'm something like uh, oil and gas industry. And I, that where I live, there's a lot of oil and gas industry. And let's say I developed an application that does something like uh, site analysis. And when I say site analysis, I mean um, like... Uh, I'm analyzing how much oil reserves I might have at a specific site. And what I can do is, is this app, I've spent maybe a lot of money developing this app. And in order for this app to run, I have to run it on top of a, a, you know, a Linux server or I have to run it on top of a Windows server. Well, what I can do is instead of going and buying new hardware, because my hardware ages over time, I can actually make a server here in the cloud and then I'm still in charge of that server. It just behaves like a regular server, but instead of being in my basement, it's in the Azure environment. So now I can go in and I can configure, I can install my own custom software. I'm going to have more responsibility at this point. With software as a service, most of the responsibility lies with the cloud provider, and I just use the software. When it comes to infrastructure as a service, then I'm actually, I'm in charge of managing the infrastructure and everything. I'm just using their hardware to build my own infrastructure. I can even create my own networks, my own virtual networks. I basically replicate my infrastructure. This right now is sort of the hot area of cloud computing because a lot of companies, as their infrastructure ages, they're asking themselves the question, do I replace or upgrade my infrastructure or do I move it into the cloud where it makes sense? And sometimes this is referred to as a hybrid cloud solution where part of my infrastructure is on premise and part of my infrastructure is in the cloud. And we're seeing a lot of work 
to migrate what I can into the cloud. So that's the infrastructure as a service. Now, here's what I consider when I'm talking to students. This is the one that's a little bit tricky for students to understand. It's called platform as a service. Now, platform as a service kind of sits in between the two. So software as a service, most of the responsibility is with the cloud provider. I'm just using their software. Good example would be Salesforce, right? Infrastructure as a service, I'm still in charge of everything and I'm just really just using the cloud provider's hardware, but I don't have to, I bring my own, you know, I might even bring my own licenses or anything. Platform as a service says, you might want to write your own software the cloud provider will provide the infrastructure, but the cloud provider will also provide platform services. What do I mean by platform services? A very common platform is they might provide you, in the case of Azure, they might provide you with something like a SQL database. Okay, So they provide the database, they provide the infrastructure to support that database, and what you do is you configure, not the infrastructure, but you configure the database. So you'll populate that database with your own data, you'll populate that database with your own user accounts and everything, and they will manage the infrastructure and they will manage the platform that you're using and they'll configure, you'll use your own software, but you'll also configure that platform, for example, a database. was Is that clear? I, I know, Helmut, you said you're studying for this exam. Does that distinction between those three things make a lot of sense? If you're still around, you can let me know. Hopefully that, that makes sense to you, right? So the, that's always the hardest one for folks to understand because, you know, the, the software as a service, again, you're just using software that somebody else has written. Infrastructure, you're just using their hardware, but you really are you know, still managing all the nitty gritty details, configuring backups, configuring all the, the configuration of the network and such. Platform is the one where they give you the infrastructure, but then they'll also give you some sort of platform service, quite often a database. So they'll give you a database, but it could be something like an email service, but you then go in and configure all the mailboxes and the route, or they could give you some sort of uh, platform. And it is, can be, it's the platform as a service is always the one that's the most confusing. So if you're studying for the exam, that's the one where you want to do some practice questions and, and it'll sort of be, hopefully with what I've said this evening, as well as with a, just a little bit of, you know, exploration into the difference between structure and platform. Hopefully you'll be in a good position to understand those questions, right? Nine times out of 10, um, I don't know what's on the exams. Nine times, <laughs> you're not allowed to divulge what's on exams, but nine times out of 10 or so, I'm guessing that, that they're probably use a database sample when it comes to platform as a service, right? If we go back to Azure, let's pop into Azure for a second here. So I'll pop into some of the Azure services here. You can see here that, for example, I can do an infrastructure as a service. So I could go to compute, right? So when I go here underneath compute, I could go in and grab something like my very own um, my very own Windows 7 Enterprise. I could grab a Windows server in here. You always have to look for them. You can also search for them at the top. It, it doesn't matter here, but I could go in. There we go. So here I could go Windows Server 2022 Data Center, Azure Edition. And this is a core server, which means it doesn't have a graphic interface to it. So this is just a server that's running. This is an example of an infrastructure element. It's a server that I'm then going to go in. I'm going to install my own software. I'm going to configure it. I'm going to work with it. Something like platform as a service would be something like, you know, for example, if I go in and grab um, the most common with databases. So here I'll go in, I could either grab a, uh, a, you know, my very own database as a platform here. So instead of having to go in and build the database or install the database, I have this pre-configured database. So the database would be a platform, the database server would be infrastructure, an application that uses the database would be software as a service. So that should be good. Um, yeah, there's just choosing the three. So hopefully, um, 
and this one here, which cloud service model allows you to run Azure containers, that's infrastructure. So that so what you're doing is you're running containers and then you're putting your own objects into those containers, your own VMs in those containers. That would be an example where we do something called a lift and shift. So a lot of times what we'll do is in a, um, I'll clear this up again. So a lot of times if I'm in that hybrid scenario, what I will do is I might have a server and this server is all completely configured to work with my applications. It's got everything working here. It's got a number of connections into it. What I will do is I can use software that will take this server and I will build a virtual machine out of that server. So the virtual machine will look just like that server. It'll be a basically a VM of the server. Think of it almost like taking a copy of the server. And then, is it? There we go. So I'll take a copy of the server. And then what I'll do is I will take that virtual machine. I will put it into the cloud infrastructure. So I'll put it into the cloud infrastructure as a virtual machine. And then what I'll do is all of these client machines that were connecting into this server, I will just redirect them so that they're now connecting into the cloud server. You know, it's like, like everything, the devil's in the details. It's not just a matter of make a virtual copy of the machine, put it in the cloud, and instead of every point, everybody pointing to address 123, it's now 345. Sometimes it is that simple, but a lot of times you have to do a little bit of configuration here. But now this machine is running in Azure. Very cool thing that you can do with this as well. This is maybe getting a little bit into virtualization as opposed to uh, cloud. But let's say I have a server and that server is really good. And let's say for the sake of argument that this server has, you know, I'll do it really low, eight gigs of RAM. And let's say the hard drive is a one terabyte hard drive, right? You know, and, and, and I want to upgrade the server. I want more, more storage and I want more memory. Here's a cool trick you can do. You can turn that server into a virtual machine put that virtual machine onto a more powerful machine or into the cloud. And then you can allocate more RAM for the server and more storage for the server. And all of a sudden that server just goes, oh, I just got bigger. I have more memory and I have more storage. And in fact, as you get, again, more customers or require more powers, you don't have to constantly turn the server off add more hardware, configure the hardware, reboot it, make sure it's working. All you have to do is go into your Azure virtual machine and dial in more resources on an as needed basis. And if for some reason people start using it less, you can dial it back and start saving money. So that's a very, that's called elasticity. So the fact that the cloud is elastic and the fact that uh, virtual machines are elastic is, is, is really powerful. It's one of the more powerful aspects of, of virtualization and cloud services. So we take a look at, uh, you know, sort of where do cloud services fit in terms of the history of computing? First wave, second wave, it's a third wave technology. I've talked a little bit about software as a service, infrastructure as a service, and platform as a service. I'm sure you can imagine there's there's a lot more to talk about specific cloud technologies, but I just wanted to give you the higher level overview. There are some challenges to the cloud. Obviously, one of the biggest challenges to the cloud is in the cloud. What do we mean by that? Well, it really means that being on a data center owned by someone else. There, the, the joke is the cloud is just somebody else's computer. I don't like, I mean, that's true. But the cloud is really somebody else's multi-billion dollar geo-redundant data center, right? You know, it's like saying that my GPS connects to somebody else's satellite. You know, it does, but it's also a multi-billion dollar geo-diverse, you know, expert monitored, secured, you know, um, managed environment. But anyways, so the, the obviously your connection here is the good old internet. So, you know, I'll have some people that will talk to me. One of the things about having a YouTube channel is that you end up with a global audience. So some people will say to me, you know, um, I can't use the cloud because I am in an area with very uh, slow internet. And that, that's completely valid. 
you don't have a good internet connection, you don't need super fast internet. You just need internet that can handle the keyboard, the video, and the mouse. And you'd be surprised at, um, at how little that can sometimes be. If you can run, if you can play a online video game on your computer here, you can access a virtual machine on the cloud. If you have intermittent internet or very low speed internet, this is changing in the world as the world becomes more internet dense and we have more high speed internet using more cloud services makes more sense. The same applies to your phone. If you have an application that plays music like Spotify, what is that you guys can, if this was a classroom, I'd have you all put up your hands, but you know, what is Spotify? Spotify is software as a service, right? Spotify or Apple Music is just software as a service. You're using a front end. In fact, it's really a website. And what it's doing is it's going through the internet and it's connecting up to a cloud data store. It has, you know, authentication to make sure that you've got a valid account or you're gonna get the ones with ads. So it's got a bunch of logic there but ultimately, it's just a giant database of all the songs that Spotify has, and you have an interface into that. Now, Spotify often, and a lot of phone apps, will have some local storage, so you can download you know, some of the songs that you like if you're going on a road trip or somewhere where you'll have slow internet. But effectively, it's running software as a service, a cloud, and then there is a relationship between that cloud service and Spotify in terms of, you know, Spotify is managing security, Spotify is managing the song library, right? They're doing all of that, which is also sometimes, you know, besides the internet speed, sometimes people criticize the fact that somebody else owns the, the music that you're using. This comes to another book that I, I brought out today, and this is something called The Membership Economy. And the membership, I also have this link down below as well. With the membership economy, the concept there is that people are generally moving away from being product focused and they're being more concerned with services and participation. So there is a challenge. I mean, if I go and buy a record, uh, you know, back in the old days, you buy LPs or a CD or some sort of, you know, music, I have that. Uh, this was a big argument for a lot of my friends and myself included, like video games. So um, people would collect video games. You can't really collect a digital video game, right? You're not going to find that something that people collect because it's something you can download. But people would collect the physical video games. So I remember when a lot of companies like Sony were moving from a pure physical model and trying to go with a more digital model. And a classic example of this, which is, is you know, you may or may not know about this. Sony used to have handheld game units. The first one that they had was something called a PSP. The last generation one they had was something called the Sony Vita. But in between, there was an all-digital device called the PSP Go. And the PSP Go... You, you didn't have any games that you had physical games. You just would download them digitally onto the PSP Go using your Sony account. And as long as the Sony store existed and as long as bought were downloadable, you were fine. But if for some reason they closed that store, all the games you had could never be downloaded. That people said that's a big problem. And you don't think it's a huge problem, but games are a good example. There have been a number of online games where they have shut down the servers. You can no longer play them. A good example would be a Star Trek game. Um, a good example is one by Google, which is a massive comp company, but Google had a product called Stadia, and I believe their servers are closing down in the next few days. So they wanted you to play video games online, so you would have a Chromecast, you would play the games. Now, here, you would also move the graph out of the problem because move the graphs back and forth. You needed a pretty fast, pretty stable internet. And uh, that was a problem. They're shutting down the Stadia servers. 
In fact, they're doing a whole bunch of refund to people who paid for games and such because of that. It's very fascinating. That's a bit of a digression. So I hope that you've been able to sort of see the different elements of the cloud tonight. Um, I don't want to go, I can go on and on. If there's any questions you have, comment down below, either, um, you know, after afterwards or now if you put it on here. I'm always interested in different topics that you might be interested in, and I'm happy to make videos or future live streams on those. So thanks, everybody, for, for coming by tonight. I hope it was useful for you. It's been about an hour, so I'm trying to keep things down to about an hour on these live streams. Uh, hopefully you learned something. And if not, please comment down below, and I'll see if I can help clarify even further. Thanks very much for joining me on the live stream here. I'll go back to, to this here. Remove that there. Okay, so thank you guys very much for joining me on the live stream. I'm going to try to do another live stream on networking skills probably the first week of December. I'm going to go through the different layers of the OSI model uh, for anybody who might be studying for something like the Network Plus exam or the Cisco CCNA exam. If there's any topics that are challenging for you in those areas, I'm going to try to do some live streams on those as well as maybe some things on virtualization or any topics that you wound up commenting down below that you would like me to help you with. Talk to you later. And, and don't forget to watch my regular videos because I'm releasing those uh, one or two every week. And, and so keep watching those, share them with your friends, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.